Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Bree Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you enjoy our show, be sure to follow us so you get all the new episodes. If you want to see exclusive behind the scenes of our show, join our Patreon. We would also love for you to drop us a rating on your favorite podcast platform and share our show with your friends. You can catch us on all the social medias at Bite at a Time Books. We are now part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you ever wondered what inspired your favorite classic novelists to write their stories, what was happening in their lives or the world at the time, check out Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story, Tuesdays starting January 4th, wherever you listen to podcasts. Today we will be starting Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Preface A preface to the first edition of Jane Eyre being unnecessary, I gave none. This second edition demands a few words both of acknowledgement and miscellaneous remark. My thanks are due in three quarters. To the public, for the indulgent ear it has inclined to a plain tale with few pretensions. To the press, for the fair field its honest suffrage has opened to an obscure aspirant. To my publishers, for the aid their tact, their energy, their practical sense, and frank liberality have afforded an unknown and unrecommended author. The press and the public are but vague personifications for me, and I must thank them in vague terms. But my publishers are definite. So are certain generous critics who have encouraged me as only large-hearted and high-minded men know how to encourage a struggling stranger. To them, i.e. my publishers, and the select reviewers, I say cordially, Gentlemen, I thank you from my heart. Having thus acknowledged what I owe those who have aided and approved me, I turn to another class, a small one so far as I know, but not therefore to be overlooked. I mean the timorous or carping few who doubt the tendency of such books as Jane Eyre, in whose eyes whatever is unusual is wrong, whose ears detect in each protest against bigotry that parent of crime, an insult to piety, that regent of God on earth. I would suggest to such doubters certain obvious distinctions. I would remind them of certain simple truths. Conventionality is not morality. Self-righteousness is not religion. To attack the first is not to assail the last. To pluck the mask from the face of the Pharisee is not to lift an impious hand to the crown of thorns. These things and deeds are diametrically opposed. They are as distinct as is vice from virtue. Men too often confound them. They should not be confounded. Appearance should not be mistaken for truth. Narrow human doctrines that only tend to elate and magnify a few should not be substituted for the world-redeeming creed of Christ. There is, I repeat it, a difference, and it is a good and not a bad action to mark broadly and clearly the line of separation between them. The world may not like to see these ideas dissevered, for it has been accustomed to blend them, finding it convenient to make external show pass for sterling worth, to let whitewashed walls vouch for clean shrines. It may hate him who dares to scrutinize and expose, to raise the gilding and show base metal under it, to penetrate the sepulchre and reveal charnel relics, but hate as it will, it is indebted to him. Ahab did not like Micaiah because he never prophesied good concerning him, but evil. Probably he liked the psychophant son of Chaniah better. Yet might Ahab have escaped a bloody death, had he stopped his ears to flattery and opened them to faithful counsel. There is a man in our own days whose words are not framed to tickle delicate ears, who to my thinking comes before the great ones of society much as the son of Imla came before the throned kings of Judah and Israel, and who speaks truth as deep, with a power as prophet-like and as vital, a mean as dauntless and as daring. Is the satirist of Vanity Fair admired in high places, I cannot tell, but I think if some of those amongst whom he hurls the Greek fire of his sarcasm, and over whom he flashes the leaven brand of his denunciation, were to take his warnings in time, they or their seed might yet escape a fatal Rimeth Gilead. Why have I alluded to this man? 
I have alluded to him, reader, because I think I see in him an intellect profounder and more unique than his contemporaries have yet recognized, because I regard him as the first social regenerator of the day, as the very master of that working corpse who would restore to rectitude the warped system of things. Because I think no commentator on his writings has yet found the comparison that suits him, the terms which rightly characterize his talent, they say he is like Fielding, they talk of his wit, humor, comic powers. He resembles Fielding as an eagle does a vulture. Fielding could stoop on carrion, but Thackeray never does. His wit is bright, his humor attractive, but both bear the same relation to his serious genius that the mere lambent sheet lighting playing under the edge of the summer cloud does to the electric death spark hid in its womb. Finally, I have alluded to Mr. Thackeray, because to him, if he will accept the tribute of a total stranger, I have dedicated this second edition of Jane Eyre, Currer Bell. December 21st, 1847 Note to the third edition. I avail myself of the opportunity which a third edition of Jane Eyre affords me, of again addressing a word to the public, to explain that my claim to the title of novelists rest on this one work alone. If, therefore, the authorship of other works of fiction has been attributed to me, an honor is awarded where it is not merited, and consequently denied where it is justly due. This explanation will serve to rectify mistakes which may already have been made and to prevent further errors. Currer Bell, April 13th, 1848 Chapter 1 There was no possibility of taking a walk that day. We had been wandering indeed in the leafless shrubbery an hour in the morning, but since dinner, Mrs. Reed, when there was no company, dined early, the cold winter wind had brought with it clouds so somber and a rain so penetrating that further outdoor exercise was now out of the question. I was glad of it. I never liked long walks, especially on chilly afternoons. Dreadful to me was the coming home in the raw twilight with nipped fingers and toes and a heart saddened by the chidings of Bessie the nurse and humbled by the consciousness of my physical inferiority to Eliza, John, and Georgiana Reed. The said Eliza, John, and Georgiana were now clustered round their mamma in the drawing room. She lay reclined on a sofa by the fireside, and with her darlings about her, for the time neither quarreling nor crying, looked perfectly happy. Me she had dispensed from joining the group, saying, She regretted to be under the necessity of keeping me at a distance, but that until she heard from Bessie and could discover by her own observation that I was endeavoring in good earnest to acquire a more sociable and childlike disposition, a more attractive and sprightly manner, something lighter, franker, more natural as it were, she really must exclude me from privileges intended only for contented, happy little children. What does Bessie say I have done, I asked. Jane, I don't like cavillers or questioners. Besides, there is something truly forbidding in a child taking up her elders in that manner. Be seated somewhere, and until you can speak pleasantly, remain silent. A breakfast room adjoined the drawing room. I slipped in there. It contained a bookcase. I soon possessed myself of a volume, taking care that it should be one stored with pictures. I mounted into the window seat, gathering up my feet. I sat cross-legged like a Turk, and having drawn the red moreen curtain nearly close, I was shrined in double retirement. Folds of scarlet drapery shut in my view to the right hand. To the left were the clear panes of glass, protecting but not separating me from the drear November day. At intervals, while turning over the leaves of my book, I studied the aspect of that winter afternoon. Afar it offered a pale blank of mist and cloud, Near a scene of wet lawn and storm-beat shrub, with ceaseless rain sweeping away wildly before a long and lamentable blast. I returned to my book, Bewick's History of British Birds, the letterpress thereof I cared little for, generally speaking, and yet there were certain introductory pages that, child as I was, I could not pass quite as a blank. They were those which treat of the haunts of sea-fowl, the solitary rocks and promontories, by them only inhabited, of the coast of Norway, studded with isles from its southern extremity, the Lindeness, 
or Nays, to the North Cape, where the northern ocean in vast whirls boils round the naked melancholy isles, a furthest thole and the Atlantic surge pours in among the stormy Hebrides. Nor could I pass unnoticed the suggestion of the bleak shores of Lapland, Siberia, Spitsbergen, Nova Zembla, Iceland, Greenland, with the vast sweep of the Arctic zone, in those forlorn regions of dreary space, that reservoir of frost and snow, where the firm fields of ice, the accumulation of centuries of winters, glazed in alpine heights above heights, surrounded the pole, and concentra the multiplied rigors of extreme cold. Of these death-white realms I formed an idea of my own, shadowy like all the half-comprehended notions that float dim through children's brains, but strangely impressive. The words in these introductory pages connected themselves with the succeeding vignettes and gave significance to the rock standing up alone in a sea of billow and spray, to the broken boat stranded on a desolate coast, to the cold and ghastly moon glancing through bars of cloud at a wreck just sinking. I cannot tell what sentiment haunted the quite solitary churchyard, with its inscribed headstone, its gate, its two trees, its low horizon girdled by a broken wall, and its newly risen crescent attesting the hour of eventide. The two ships becalmed on a torpid sea, I believe to be marine phantoms. The fiend pinning down the thief's pack behind him, I passed over quickly. It was an object of terror. So was the black horned thing seated aloof on a rock, surveying a distant crowd surrounding a gallows. Each picture told a story, mysterious often to my undeveloped understanding and imperfect feelings, yet ever profoundly interesting, as interesting as the tales Bessie sometimes narrated on winter evenings when she chanced to be in good humor, and when, having brought her ironing table to the nursery hearth, she allowed us to sit about it, and while she got up Mrs. Reed's lace frills and crimped her nightcap borders, fed our eager attention with passages of love and adventure, taken from old fairy tales and other ballads. Or, as at a later period I discovered, from the pages of Pamela and Henry, Earl of Moreland. With Bedwick on my knee I was then happy, happy at least in my way. I feared nothing but interruption, and that came too soon. The breakfast room door opened. Bo, Madame Mope, cried the voice of John Reed. Then he paused. He found the room apparently empty. Where the dickens is she, he continued. Lizzie, Georgie, calling to his sisters. Joan is not here. Tell Mama she has run out into the rain. Bad animal. It is well I drew the curtain, thought I, and I wished fervently he might not discover my hiding place. Nor would John Reed have found it out himself. He was not quick either of vision or conception. But Eliza just put her head in at the door and said at once, She is in the window seat to be sure, Jack. And I came out immediately, for I trembled at the idea of being dragged forth by the said Jack. What do you want? I asked with awkward diffidence. Say, what do you want, Master Reed? was the answer. I want you to come here. And seating himself in an armchair, he intimated by a gesture that I was to approach and stand before him. John Reed was a schoolboy of fourteen years old, four years older than I, for I was but ten, large and stout for his age, with a dingy and unwholesome skin, thick lineaments and a spacious visage, heavy limbs and large extremities. He gorged himself habitually at table, which made him bilious, and gave him a dim and bleared eye and flabby cheeks. He ought now to have been at school but his mamma had taken him home for a month or two on account of his delicate health. Mr. Miles, the master, affirmed that he would do very well if he had fewer cakes and sweetmeats, sent him from home, but the mother's heart turned from an opinion so harsh and inclined rather to the more refined idea that John's sallowness was owing to over-application, and perhaps to pining after home. John had not much affection for his mother and sisters, and an antipathy to me. He bullied and punished me not two or three times in the week, nor once or twice in the day, but continually. Every nerve I had feared him, and every morsel of flesh in my bones shrank when he came near. There were moments when I was bewildered by the terror he inspired. Because I had no appeal whatever against either his menaces or his inflictions, 
The servants did not like to offend their young master by taking my part against him, and Mrs. Reed was blind and deaf on the subject. She never saw him strike or heard him abuse me, though he did both now and then in her very presence, more frequently, however, behind her back. Habitually obedient to John, I came up to his chair. He spent some three minutes in thrusting out his tongue at me as far as he could without damaging the roots. I knew he would soon strike, and while dreading the blow, I mused on the disgusting and ugly appearance of him who would presently deal it. I wonder if he read that notion in my face, for all at once, without speaking, he struck suddenly and strongly. I tottered, and on regaining my equilibrium, retired back a step or two from his chair. That is for your impudence in answering Mama a while since, said he, and for your sneaking way of getting behind curtains, and for the look you had in your eyes two minutes since, you rat. Accustomed to John Reed's abuse, I never had an idea of replying to it. My care was how to endure the blow which would certainly follow the insult. What were you doing behind the curtain, he asked. I was reading. Show the book. I returned to the window and fetched it thence. You have no business to take our books. You are a dependent, Mama says. You have no money. Your father left you none. You ought to beg and not to live here with gentlemen's children like us and eat the same meals we do and wear clothes at our Mama's expense. Now I'll teach you to rummage my bookshelves, for they are mine. All the house belongs to me, or will do in a few years. Go and stand by the door out of the way of the mirror and the windows. I did so, not at first aware what was his intention, but when I saw him lift and poise the book and stand and act to hurl it, I instinctively started aside with a cry of alarm. Not soon enough, however, the volume was flung. It hit me and I fell, striking my head against the door and cutting it. The cut bled. The pain was sharp. My terror had passed its climax. Other feelings succeeded. Wicked and cruel boy, I said. You are like a murderer. You are like a slave driver. You are like the Roman emperors. I had read Goldsmith's History of Rome and had formed my opinion of Nero, Caligula, also, I had drawn parallels in silence, which I never thought thus to have declared aloud. What? What? he cried. Did she say that to me? Did you hear her, Eliza and Georgiana? Won't I tell Mama? But first... He ran headlong at me. I felt him grasp my hair and my shoulder. He had closed with a desperate thing. I really saw in him a tyrant, a murderer. I felt a drop or two of blood from my head trickle down my neck and was sensible of somewhat pungent suffering. These sensations for the time predominated over fear, and I received him in a frantic sort. I don't very well know what I did with my hands, but he called me rat, rat, and bellowed aloud. Aid was near him. Eliza and Georgiana had run for Mrs. Reed, who was gone upstairs. She now came upon the scene, followed by Bessie and her maid Abbott. We were parted. I heard the words. Dear, dear, what a fury to fly at Master John! Did ever anybody see such a picture of passion? Then Mrs. Reed subjoined, Take her away to the red room and lock her in there. Four hands were immediately laid upon me and I was borne upstairs. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. If you enjoy our show, be sure to follow us so you get all the new episodes. If you want to see exclusive behind-the-scenes of our show, join our Patreon. We would also love for you to drop us a rating on your favorite podcast platform and share our show with your friends. You can catch us on all the social medias at Bite at a Time Books. Also, be sure to check us on our website, www.biteatatimebooks.com. We are now part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you ever wondered what inspired your favorite classic novelists to write their stories, what was happening in their lives or the world at the time, check out Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story, Tuesdays starting January 4th, wherever you listen to podcasts. Again, my name is Bree Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow while we take the next bite of Jane Eyre.